Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Trauma Recovery University. I'm your host, Athena Moberg, and I have my amazing co-host with me, Bobby Parrish. Tonight's topic is trauma survivors and EMDR. What is EMDR? Is it right for you? Is it scary? Can it help you with post-traumatic stress disorder? What does EMDR even stand for? Um, does every single therapist in the whole world have a license or a certificate to do EMDR? There are so many different questions and we're going to unpack all of that for you tonight during this episode of Trauma Recovery University. And we are so excited that you've chosen to join us and spend an hour with us tonight. And before we get started, I just want to remind each and every one of you that we are so grateful for you. And the topics we discuss are given to us by you. So if you have a topic that you would like us to discuss, we just received a couple of emails a moment ago and a couple of tweets, and we want to encourage you to give us your feedback and give us the topics that you would like us to discuss. So without further ado, I do want to welcome everyone on a podcast platform. If you're listening on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, or SoundCloud, we want to remind you that this is a video broadcast. And so you can find us at our YouTube channel or on any Roku device. If you have a Roku device or a Roku TV, you can simply search for Trauma Recovery University. And if you have YouTube, you can go to youtube.com forward slash Trauma Recovery University TV. And um, once again, I'm Athena Moberg. This is my amazing co-host, Bobby Parrish. And we are going to dive right into our public service announcements tonight. And you can interact with us live right now if you're tuning in live. And it looks like there may be some people out there tuning in live. You can tweet us questions at on Twitter using the hashtag no more shame. So we're going to be monitoring the hashtag no more shame for the next hour. If you have questions and you'd like to interact with us, please feel free to do so. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, welcome my amazing co-host Bobby Parrish and she's going to educate us on a few of our upcoming events and exciting things going on with our anthology and um, take it away Bobby. Hi everybody. I'm so glad that you're here with us and that you have honored us with an hour of your time this week. Um, we know that your time is precious and it's important and so we're very grateful that you're here with us and we hope that we can bring you information and support and encouragement that's helpful to you. Um, I want to talk to you about the anthology that we have. Um, we're accepting submissions for now. We put one out every November. Last year we put out our very first one. And it was called Discover it is called Discovering True. It's available on Amazon. <clears throat> and after we put out that anthology, we self-published it. And probably within a couple of weeks, we got two different publishers who are interested in becoming the regular publisher for the anthology. And we have selected to work with Book Trope. And so they're going to be publishing our anthologies. The next one is going to come out in November of this year during No More Shame November and it is for um, survivors of any kind of sexual assault we would like to have you submit your poetry um, your essays these are nonfiction submissions we don't want fiction stories um, we only want something that is um, that has truly happened to you and if you go to the website, um, nomoreshameproject.com, you'll see a tab that says book. And under that tab is all the information that you need in order to make a submission. You can submit as many um, poems or essays as you'd like. Uh, this last year we did have several people who had multiple submissions selected. We ended up, um, I think there were approximately 20 people with about 25 different submissions that were published. Um, wonderful, wonderful stuff. I would really encourage you to hop over to Amazon and um, get a copy of it. I think it's just $4.99. Um, but wonderful stuff written by people who have gone through what we have all gone through and there's nothing like knowing that you're not alone. This year our theme is going to be discovering together and so it's about um, ways that your healing journey has been facilitated by coming into community with another survivor. So um, how has being a part of um, some kind of group or friendship 
uh, with another survivor impacted your recovery. And pretty soon we'll, we'll put out a few examples of what we think that looks like so that you know a little bit more about what that means. But right now we're accepting submissions. We will accept submissions through, I believe, the 1st of June. And then we'll have uh, the month of June in order to evaluate and choose those selections. And then we'll spend some time editing and get it over to Book Tropes for them to be able to publish the anthology for No More Shame November. We also have a couple of live events coming up. Um, the first one will be in Atlanta. And that will be the first weekend in June. And then the second one will be in Portland, Oregon. And that is the last weekend in June. Um, we don't have a whole lot of registration information available quite yet. We're kind of waiting to see how much interest there is. And so if you would go over to um, nomoreshameproject.com and sign up for our newsletter, or watch for information to be put up on the website and we promise we will update you. Um, we always update information through Twitter and Facebook and um, you can always send us an email at nomoreshameproject.com or to either Athena and I to ask for questions or if you go on the website there are a lot of contact me forms kind of all over the place. Just um, takes a minute and we respond to those as quickly as we can. So. Um, trying to think. Athena, can you think of anything else in terms of public service announcements? I, I don't think so. Um, I believe, I think that's all of our PSAs for now. Oh, I know what I wanted to let you guys know. If We always let you know this in the beginning of our Twitter chats, but we do always want to remind you that if while you're watching this broadcast you become triggered or you have um, an elevated heart rate or perhaps dry mouth or clammy hands or any type of symptoms that you might feel like you may be getting triggered because of the discussion, because the nature of the discussion it can be quite vivid sometimes, then we do urge you to just press the pause button, come back anytime in the future when you've practiced excellent self-care, and then just, just return at a, at a later time. Practice excellent self-care, and if you are in crisis, please reach out to our friends over at RAIN. Dot org. That's R-A-I-N-N dot org. They are wonderful if you happen to be in crisis. They have a 24-7 chat feature on their website. Or if you'd like to talk with someone on the telephone, I do believe it is 1-888-656-HOPE. I think it's 1-800-656-HOPE. Awesome. Um, okay. Yeah. Did you notice my question mark? I was like, is I did. it... <laughs> yeah, see, that's that's that she's. It's usually my job to type that in at the beginning of a chat. So she's been so observant now for a year and a half that she's got it pretty much memorized too. Yeah. So, bonus so, points for Athena. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm so excited that you guys have chosen to join us during this broadcast where we're going to be discussing EMDR, and I'm very excited to educate you guys on the topic because I have actually gone through EMDR therapy and I have the good, the bad, the ugly and I also have decided as a uh, helping professional to get certified in EMDR so that I can help other people. Um, and I've gone through all of the studying, all of the coursework, and the only thing I have left is my intensive where I go to, um, through my practicum. So um, once I do get that certification, I will definitely let you guys know. But tonight we're just going to have a very casual, open discussion about EMDR. What is it? Um, how can it help you? Who is it for? Who is it not for? We're just going to unpack all of that so that there's fewer uh, puzzles and questions than you had when you first pressed the play button on this video. So, yeah. Um, so where do you want to start, Bobby? Where should we start? Well, I, I don't have any. I don't have anybody sending questions or anything else in right now. So I'm just gonna. I was gonna <laughs> say gonna I'm gonna show my age by saying that I can remember when EMDR first came on the market, so to speak, and um, for the most part, the psychological, the mental health world went. Yeah, that's nice. Come back when you got a lot of research to back that one up, um, because it seemed so contrary 
to all the medical study and research that had come out to that point. Um, and I can remember being in grad school and people say, EMDR, eh, nah, you know, that's, no, we, we, we don't talk about that, we don't promote that because we're just not quite sure about that one yet. Um, and the one time that I was offered EMDR, um, when I was an inpatient at a trauma, um, a, a psychiatric unit that specialized in trauma recovery, it had not been out for long enough for me to feel comfortable um, doing that for myself. And a lot of that had to do with, um, it was for me kind of explained that it was a little bit like hypnosis and hypnosis scared the heck out of me because I didn't want to not be in control at all times that's one of my issues with my trauma is you know it's one of the reasons why I don't drink because I want always to be in control so nobody can hurt me and so uh, the thought of hypnosis scared me scared the bejeepers out of me so I, I said no 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 I'm not gonna do that so um, now though um, Athena, what you were telling me that EMDR has the highest amount of um, efficacy research out there of any trauma treatment program. Is that right? Did you tell me that? Yes, I did actually. Um, the I'm trying to find the page that it's on. On page four of Laurel Parnell's book, EMDR, in the Treatment of Adults Abused as Children, which is a great read, you guys, if any of you are interested in learning about EMDR, um, and any of you that are helping professionals, or even if you're just interested in learning about it, you can check this out at your local library. We can put this in the show notes. Laurel Parnell, um, and EMDR, in the Treatment of Adults. Um, abused as children. So on page four, there's a second paragraph down, and when we were do doing our chat this morning, I, I hadn't previously highlighted this paragraph, but I found it to be very interesting. And it says, to date, two studies have focused on the effectiveness of EMDR on healing sexual abuse in particular. And in a controlled study of rape victims done by Rothbaum in 97, and it goes on and on and on to discuss how um, that it has the most number. I'm trying to find the exact sentence. It has the most number of reports um, and tests since Shapiro's initial efficacy study. EMDR has had more published case reports and research to support it than any other method used in the treatment of trauma. Wow. And that's on, that's on page two. So that's right at the beginning of the book when it first starts just describing what EMDR actually is. And yeah. for those of you that are that are just brand new and you didn't you don't attend our Twitter chats and you're not even sure what we're talking about, EMDR is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Not reprogramming. I misspoke, <laughs> I think last year. I think last year I said something like reprogramming, and I was like, where's the delete tweet button? Oh my gosh, I don't want people to think we're reprogramming their brain. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that, that kind of, yeah. Because <laughs> that, that can scare anyone, right? Well, and right. Um, just to touch on what it is that you had mentioned a moment ago, Bobby, um, EMDR is considered a form of psychotherapy, and so that's probably like and and hip, hypnotherapy is psycho psychotherapy as well. So they do they fall under the same umbrella um, statistically, or like the way they're described. Yeah, I think uh, initially that was what a lot of people thought it sounded like. Um, <laughs> so and it was just I can I I mean I have very um, clear memories of when it first came out of people going, ah, yeah, no. Um, because it, it just, here we were doing, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy with trauma victims, and all of a sudden Francine Shapiro says, but I think if they talk about it while you make a light and their light eyes move back and forth, like, yeah, no. Um, but okay. boy, she yeah. hit on something, you know? Um, well, and it's interesting to hear um, because, you know, you're, you're a fellow uh, 
um, caregiver. You're a helping professional. Right. And so um, I didn't. I have not gone to grad school. I don't have my master's degree. I haven't been around academia as much as Bobby has. And so it's always fascinating to me to hear the responses from other helping professionals. So um, I want to address exactly what Bobby was just saying about the whole, yeah, the eyes moving back and forth, whatever. This is just a little bit weird. So um, I want to give you a little bit of background. So as I understand it, and I know the story of Francine Shapiro pretty relatively well, um, back in the late 80s, she was a grad student, and she belie I believe she was in Los Gatos, California, which is in Northern California, okay. and she was walking through a park, okay? She's walking through a park, and maybe you survivors here can identify, just picture yourself walking through a park, and she began to have these uh, memories. These thoughts. She's a trauma survivor, correct? Correct. Okay. And she was having childhood memories at the time. Well, she began to notice that while she was having these memories, these thoughts, these, these troublesome thoughts, her eyes were moving back and forth. And she, she noticed her eyes were, were moving around. And then she noticed the more she, like, she had this hypothesis that somehow the eye movement had something to do with the fact that the the effects of these troublesome memories were it was diminishing they were decreasing the effect of the trouble troublesome memories was was diminishing and so she, her hypothesis her theory was that the eye movement had something to do with it and so um, there were about 70 people that she um, had volunteer for this first case study then as of a couple of years later she had a a closed market research on 20 individuals. These individuals included Vietnam veterans, rape survivors, and sexual assault victims. And every single one of the people that experienced the eye movement, the rapid eye movement, bilateral, and they were they were like they would be thinking. So it's different than CBT. CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, you actually. Um, go into great, 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 great detail on the memory itself, and you are almost like reliving it, and you describe it to like the smells and the sounds and everything, right? Well, in EMDR, you don't even have to do that. All you, all you are, that you're beginning just a basic picture of like what it was like where you were at at the time, and while you're thinking of that basic picture or that basic memory. Not, not down to like the smells or the, the sounds or the whatever, like you're there reliving it. But while you're thinking of this particular negative connotation that you have, like let's say, um, you know, you were abused in a bathtub. And so now in the present tense, you have a hard time taking a bath. And the foreseeable future for you, you get anxiety when you think about possibly taking a bath. So there, if you're if you're applying EMDR and its theory, it deals with three areas: past, present, and future. In the past, I was abused in a bathtub. Currently, anytime I get into a bathtub, this is what I feel. I feel A, B, C, X, Y, Z. How does it really make you feel? Is it like you're back there again, or are you just like for some reason it makes you feel? Um, anxious or nervous or you tend to disassociate and then what do you feel or think when you think about in the future the possibility of taking a bath past present future so then once you have those three in place and you have a grounding technique that's been established and a grounding technique being established for for helping professionals you understand this but if you are a survivor and you're very brand new in your recovery a grounding technique is like basically thinking of the safest place in the whole wide world that you can picture yourself in. Is it a grassy meadow? Is it, for me personally, the first time I ever did EMDR, I my safe place that I was imagining was a real place. It was the, the, the pool area of the complex, the condominium complex that my son and I were living in. The reason I felt safe in there is because it was walled in all the way around. There was a a concrete wall and then there were metal gates that had locks so I knew that no one could come in unless they had a key and no one could come in and get me and so that was my safe place that was my grounding place like if I was starting to have 
a stressful feeling or a stressful thought about anything whatsoever, I would, I would calm down and I would start to think about that safe place. I would picture myself in the pool area of the condominium complex where my son and I were living where I knew that no one could get in and get me because they didn't have the key and if they did have the key it's okay they were safe so I know that all of this is sort of all over the place so um, no 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 you're talking us through it step by step and that's helpful and okay. while you're having these thoughts is she doing the bilateral yes now the first okay. time I did it the first time I did it it was offered you could do lights like we're bilaterally, bilaterally while you're thinking of the past, present, and future events, mm -hmm. you're watching this light. So no longer are you there living it, breathing it, smelling the smell of the soap, smelling the mildew in the shower, you're being abused in the bathtub, you can smell the, the clothing of your abuser or cigarette smoke or alcohol or like, our, like one of our dear friends that attends our chats, the smell of whiskey. Um, like myself, right. the smell of Marlboro Lights, like smell or the sounds. There was always a certain song playing or the certain sound of the wind blowing. If you, like if you're really uh, like triggered and you're having a major PTSD moment, which if you're right. being triggered right the now, flashback, press pause. Right. Yeah, just come, just pause. We're not going anywhere. You can come back another time and watch this practice excellent self care. So while you're in that moment and you're picturing the past event. You're picturing yourself being anxious about bathing now and having normal everyday grooming habits now because for some reason it triggers you and dis it dis you disassociate and you don't want to be disassociating. And then the thought of future occurrences where you're actually needing to take care of yourself with normal grooming and hygiene, that stresses you out as well. So while you're thinking of all of those things, you have the light and you're looking back and forth. And so, but you know that you're safe in this room and you know that you have the safe place that you can picture yourself in. And so your mind literally, when you start to think about eventually, over time, Francine Shapiro's theory is that your mind will no longer associate bathing with all of those negative things and all of the stress that it um, means to you now. It will no longer be associated with that. It would be associated with a safe place, whether it's that safe place by the pool where no one can get in unless they have the key, and if they have the key, they're a safe person. Or if your safe place is a meadow that's overlooking um, in some beautiful flowers, or and who's a safe person that you can invite into that into that safe place. So it's a lot of imagery is being used. So what I did is instead of the light, I didn't want to do the light, I did tapping and it was like on one knee and the other knee like you know I wish you could see my so knees the but. therapist is tapping you yeah and and then when um, when she would stop tapping she would say okay where are you now and I would tell her this is what's happening and, it, and it's a past experience okay and then I'm picturing the experience here in the present and then I'm concerned about a future situation where I'm gonna have to be there and so then I'm then I'm present with her. I'm present with her, and she's tapping, and she's having me tell tell it to her while while she's tapping, so that I know that I'm not back there. I may be right. I may have used to associate those things with with that fear, but now I'm here, and I'm in a safe place, and I'm with her, and I can immediately go to that safe place that we've established as my safe place, and eventually over time, your brain, when it comes to the fork in the road of Am I going to go back where the Marlboro lights and the whiskey smell and the smell of the mildew and the smell of the bathtub and I'm being abused in the bathtub when I'm younger and I'm stressed out to have a shower now because I'm going to disassociate and I'm scared in the future I'm going to have to take a shower? Or when it comes to the fork in the road there, her theory is such that your brain literally takes a different route. Right. You are it taking takes on the feelings of shower. the safe place. Yeah. You're taking a normal shower. If you're showering or you're bathing, you're in your safe place. No one can come in. No one is going to violate you. It, you're, you're in a safe place. It's okay. And then literally in your present and future, each time you're contemplating possibly getting anxious about your present situation and your future as it pertains to your old memory, you're literally, you've already made a new memory. 
you've made a new memory. You've taken a different road a couple of different times because you've gone to that safe place and you're with this safe person and they're the one that's helping you care for that. But instead of thinking back to that scary place, you're thinking of this new safe place. And so right. you train yourself with these grounding techniques so that you stay fully present, you don't disassociate, and you're in your safe place. And so there's not a negative connotation associated with if your trigger is bathing. Right. So does that make sense, Bobby? It does. It does. And then that makes a lot of sense to me. And you've said several times over time. Um, so how many – am I repeating the same scenario then with her or with the therapist? Um, I'm, I'm envisioning in my head, okay, so if the bathing is the trigger issue for me, um, and we know as survivors that you don't have just one trigger issue, but if bathing is one of them, um, does that mean I go through the same thing with her um, every appointment for like four weeks, or, or how well, How does okay. that work? That's a good question. That's a very good question. So EMDR is typically done in three phases, past, present, and future. And so um, for the first couple appointments, it's basically history, you know. Okay. So tell me the things, tell me these situations, you know. Um, what is your earliest, or, or it, the way mine was, was, so what's going on with you right now? It started in the present. And I would say, well, this is what's happening, and this is, I don't understand why I'm acting this way or thinking this way or feeling this way. And then it would be a history lesson at that point. Well, let's think back to the first time you ever experienced that. Can you think of a time when um, this felt familiar? And so then you're going back and you're talking about the history of what it was that was going on back here. Right. And then at that point, once we've established the history and how it pertains to the present, then we don't talk about future events yet. That's later on down the road. Okay. So where she just, her, her point at that point for me, this is what I experienced in my EMDR, was for me to be able to feel good now. Like how right. Robbie and I always tell you, like we want to give you tips and, and strategies to feel better right. today so that you don't have to right. go through 30, 30 years of counseling. Right. So I, um, she had just come back from a conference over on the island of Oahu uh, where she had learned a lot about EMDR and she had gotten her certification and she was around a lot of other helping professionals that had had huge success with this with their clients. And so she asked me if I wanted to try it and I said, I will do anything. I will do anything. Yes, I want to try it. Yes, please. And so I did. And I'm telling you, you guys, I mentioned this this morning in chat, and I'm going to say it to you again, okay? When I moved to Maui, I, I was literally six years into my recovery. Was I full bore, daily, journaling, going to, going to therapy every single week for six years? No. I was studying. I was reading books such as um, Love is a Choice. Um, on codependency, safe people, uh, boundaries. I was studying these types of things going, okay, I had no idea that my failed relationships in my adult life had anything to do with my childhood. That sounds like a bunch of mumbo jumbo. I want to prove that wrong. Well, what I ended up doing was proving its accuracy. And that is that I did, I didn't even remember that I had had all that childhood trauma. I literally was in complete denial that I had a traumatic childhood. I still was of the opinion, and mind you, I was in my 20s, I was still of the opinion that my childhood was just like everybody else's. Get over yourself. It, it's, you're not a special snowflake. You know, it yeah. was normal. It was normal. Um, because of that whole gas lamping that we talked about before. Right. Like, right. what are you talking right. about? No one else, no one else right. is complaining. What? Right. Why are you complaining? Um, you should just be grateful. So, right. So if you guys can picture me uh, 15 years ago, <laughs> so 50 pounds lighter, <laughs> um, I was really, um, I was not in a healthy place mentally and emotionally, but I thought that I was. I thought I was, you know, I have a really good job, I make enough money, my son has everything he needs, he's very loved, he's not abused, um, everything looks good on the outside, everything looks good on the outside, you know, I right. just, I just figured I, if I could make it shine, if I could shine it up and make everything just perfectly in order and fit into nice neat little boxes with bows that 
that that would fix everything. I didn't know until I moved to Hawaii in 2006 that I hadn't even accepted the fact that I had had crazy childhood stuff. I knew that there was a little bit of it. In the year 2000, I actually sat down with one of my family members, one of my abusers, and I said, you need to sit down. This isn't for you. This is for me. I have some things I need to say. I remember this. I remember this. I remember everything. I remember it. I forgive you. I just want to move forward and have a relationship with you. But I need you to stop painting some sort of magical picture of how my childhood was so awesome when that isn't really the case. Right. You need to stop doing that. It's not okay that you're doing that. And that was the first step in me getting healthy. It was like I had never stood up for myself before. And it felt really, really good. So six years of that going, okay, I remember that things weren't that great, but I want to be healthy. I want to move forward. I want to be involved in my community and volunteer and be in the PTA and football and baseball and 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 Cub Scouts and I mean I just want to, if I could get involved in just enough social activities and be the super mom and the SUV and the super everything and the team mom and bake the cookies and have the parties, if I could do all of that everything would be fine because now I have a healthy boundary with these family members and I'm putting my life back together. Awesome. I have it all together. Right. And then, and then I moved to Hawaii and my world came crashing down around me. I shattered all the bones in my ankle. I was incapacitated for six weeks where you have nothing to do but think. And I was not only immobilized and not able to move for the first time in my life, but I was actually safe for the first time in my life. No one could get me. I couldn't go anywhere to get somewhere. I was literally still for six weeks. And I began digging and digging and digging and journaling and remembering and remembering and remembering. And it was like, I remember I had the phrase that I, that I felt at that moment describe my life is, I think I'm making up all these memories. How could any of this have ever even happened? I'm making up these memories. These memories do not exist. Yeah. I'm, I must yeah. be inventing them. They're crazy. <laughs> But right, things like this really don't happen, and they certainly didn't happen to me. Yeah, I must have seen too many scary movies or something. Like, that definitely never happened to me. That happened, I must have watched that on a scary movie. Yeah, right? Yep, exactly. I, you know, we hear that. I know you and I both hear that a lot from survivors when they're first getting their memories is, this can't be right. This just can't be right. I must be making this up. Yeah. yeah. So much self-doubt. Um, the cool thing is, is that I was already plugged into like an awesome, you know, like I had shared with you before, Bobby, even though us as survivors, we get told so many times that those things never existed and we're just making them up. And so, right. you know, just stop making stuff up, you know, but the cool thing was, is I was already plugged into an awesome, awesome group of people in my community and they were all going to these different studies and these, um, it was called Life Solutions. It's very, very, very similar to Celebrate Recovery, uh -huh. um, which is um, like a, not like a 12-step, but it's, it's more addiction-based. Um, but there were other studies that you could take. You could, there were studies on infidelity and pornography addiction. Um, there were studies on boundaries and safe people and codependency and they were these amazing people that had, they, they weren't the sweeper under the ruggers. They weren't the people that were like, okay, let's just not talk about that. Right. Let's not, let's not talk about that. No, no, let's not talk about that. They were like, let's dig, let's dig into there. What, what is it? Let, what more is there? What, what right. have you been through? Oh, what else happened? What else happened? What else happened? Right? Wow. So, That's so awesome. Oh, it was so, it was phenomenal. It was spectacular. So I, I took a couple of the classes more than one time and I started remembering more and more and more and so then I, had, I was going to one-on-one -on -one counseling and by the time I was going to one-on-one -on -one counseling for like a year and I was going to group and I, I figured, okay, this is, this is big. This is going to be a lot of energy and I don't know if I'm going to be able to handle all this. I, I definitely think I was so overwhelmed by the magnitude of what I had been through 
and the energy it was going to take to try to heal from all of it and have healthy relationships that I needed I I felt like if I made myself an appointment for like a couple years down the road to go like commit myself somewhere to like rest and sleep for a month and get nothing but like positive care that I would feel better just knowing that that was in place. So I literally called the number in the back of one of the books and tried to make an appointment for like two years away. And they thought I was kidding. <laughs> I was in the middle. Bob, you remember me telling you that story? Yes, yes, yes. I do. Oh my gosh. I was I was yeah. in the middle of like going through all of the EMDR and finding my safe place and going through all this stuff. So this is the long and the short of the EMDR thing and we are going to go down and we're going to do this one page here in a moment, which I know we normally already have the one page normally up going through it, but we're going to do that in just a second. We've gone through almost everything on the one page, so it'll be a very good resource for you. But this is the thing. When you start having these memories and you start, if you choose to go to, through, to, um, through EMDR, go through with EMDR, I'm fumbling over my words, um, it can be very, very scary. And the reason that it is so, 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 so scary, and Bobby and I talk about this in a lot of other videos with you guys, EMDR takes you to the scary middle. So when you're at EMDR, you are talking about those scary things that happened before. You're relating it to what's triggered you now and what could possibly happen in the future. And you are attacking all of that at once and you're acknowledging that it exists and you can't pretend that it doesn't exist anymore. You can't just wish it away. You can't shove it under the rug. You can't change the subject. You're actually going through it instead of right. around it. And not dissociating either. And you're not disassociating because right. you literally are unable to disassociate when you're doing EMDR. You're, you, it's, it's impossible because you're so fully present because you're watching the light or you're z z z z z you, they have the little um, sensory paddles or there's tapping going on or they have the little headphones that you can wear that are like doo, 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 like the little yeah. the tones right, right. so you're it, it's impossible to disassociate while you're doing EMDR so it's the scary middle you guys you're not over here where you're like nope that never happened and you're not over here where you're like okay I just want to go through it right now I just want to just tackle all of it you're like in the scary middle where you're, you're dealing with it in a healthy way like Either it never happened or it's going to be completely gone or wait, I have to actually go through it and deal with it. So right. like that scary middle that it really is scary, you guys. That is It is scary. It is. It's, yeah. it, and, and I think this is one of the things that we want to make sure that you understand that um, EMDR has an incredible benefit, but you have to able kind of almost be able to tolerate a little bit of distress initially. Does that does that sound right, Athena? It does. It absolutely does. And I have the perfect analogy that Bobby always uses um, that she has taught me. And so when you go to your appointments and you talk to your therapist or you're going through any type of group or anything like that, oftentimes afterwards you will be so emotionally depleted and exhausted for like days. You'll feel shredded and just immobilized and you need to sleep and and we Bobby often has taught like taught me the phrase it's like a vulnerability hangover. And so what happens when you do EMDR? This is the scary part that I am glad I didn't know about because I was like, yes, 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 I'll do anything. I'll do anything. Let's do it. Let's do it. If I would have known how completely hungover I would be every week, and when you're hungover, literally like from some sort of a substance, you tend to be crabby or or um, easily irritated because you're just not yourself. You're just overwhelmed in your thoughts and your feelings, and you're not all you're not a hundred percent. So when you're hungover from this processing of all of this emotion, so that you're working through it and you're not going under it, over it, or around it. Right. 
it can be emotionally taxing. And it can be, and it is. It is extremely emotionally taxing, you guys. I'm not going to lie to you and sugarcoat it and candy coat it with a little cherry on top. No, this is hard work. Recovery is hard work. But I am telling you right now that the results are real. The results that I experienced were completely real. I was the healthiest I've been in my entire life after my EMDR. I processed the first level of the onion, or maybe it was the second or the 289th level of my onion, right. um, and I processed it. I went through it. I peeled back every single layer. I looked at it. I figured out a way to, to work through it and to find my safe place and, and, and to continue to study and to be a, you know, a mom and go to work and function, and I, I was very healthy. I mean, mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, and spiritually, all five of them completely healthy after I did my EMDR. I was so, I was new. I felt brand new. It wasn't until I had trauma, in a, like a very, very big trauma come. Right that I felt like someone just, just unraveled everything, just pulled the string and everything just went and just all fell right. apart. Right. You know, yeah. and and when that happens, you guys, it doesn't it's very easy for us as survivors to think, oh my gosh, all the hard work that I just went through is gone. It's completely right. gone. I spent the last six years building this sandcastle and some jerk face just ran through my sandcastle and ruined it. Right. Like it would be very, very, very easy to, to feel like that. But that is not true. It is not true. What I know now as a survivor now in the year 2015 is that to the degree that my body and my mind were able to remember my trauma is the degree to which I was able to move through it instead of go around it and I moved through it in a safe way and I was in a safe place and I was able to address every single piece of it that I knew about it wasn't until years later when I got a random email from my very first abuser that all of a sudden my sandcastle collapsed yeah. and all the neat little piles and neat little uh, little carrots and things and you know Rapunzel all with her hair and it was all pretty and there were dragons and horses and it was so pretty on my sandcastle all that went away the moment that that email came but it didn't really you guys it was it was like I thought I was on the 289th layer of my onion well this was like five times deeper that I had not ever even known about. It was so right. much more. It was we never we never lose that progress that we've made. We just have to remember that we're go now we're going deeper. And you know, trauma is cumulative. So when you have a new trauma, it will bang up against and reverberate against all the prior trauma that you've had and that will stir stuff up. It really will. And so now you're you know the dust unsettles a bit and you're able to go into the deeper levels um, trauma is very much and I know we've talked about this before but trauma is very much a cyclical uh, trauma recovery is cyclical so if you imagine that your trauma occurs if you're looking at a tornado trauma occurs at the very bottom um, of the tornado and you know and the cows are spinning around and it's tight little turns and they're bonking you around I always think of that movie Twister when I when I think of this um, analogy but gradually the, the cycles the spins get bigger and they get bigger and they get bigger you don't stop spinning it's just that your circles are getting wider and you're tackling different layers and different layers and different layers. Just because you go back and you see something like, oh wait, I already saw that cow. I already processed that cow. Well, maybe you did, but it was a bit down here and now you have to do this level up here. So when you lose your footing and you feel like, um, gosh, I just, you know, my whole sandcastle went away. I have to start all over again. No you're not starting all over again you're just getting into a deeper level that needs to be healed and like Athena's given that metaphor of the onion you know 
you have to get to that core. You have to get to that core stuff. And in order to do that, we have to take it apart layer by layer. And that's just unfortunately the nature of the trauma beast. Um, wish it weren't, yeah. but it is. But you know, when you say that, you said I was a new person. I can remember looking at um, PET scans, um, positive emission tomography. It's a brain scan. And um, they did some. Um, war veterans who had PTSD and they showed a picture of their brain scan before EMDR and there were a lot of dark spots where there was no brain activity and then they showed after they'd gone through EMDR another PET scan, they did another PET scan and the parts that had been dark before were now lit up and active and it was truly, I mean stark difference between A and B that the brain does have the capacity to reintegrate and reawaken parts that had been shut down um, and to me that I, I, don't, I can't think of a more powerful testament to a therapy modality than both the patient's reports like you said I felt like a new person and then you look at that hardcore scientific evidence and you can't look at that and not go, you know what, got to give EMDR a shot. Um, I know it's not available to everyone and we had several people in chat this morning talk about how um, EMDR was not available to them through their insurance company. Um, and that's a reality. I know um, it's really unfortunate. And I, but I know it's not available to you. If it is available to you, uh, it might be something that you would really want to seriously look into. Because uh, I've heard, you know, within the last four or five years, nothing but but good stuff about it. So yeah, I I definitely I know that like this morning when we were talking about um, EMDR and and we did have you know a few of our our people in our community talking about. You know, well, what do you do when uh, that's not available in our pay grade? You know, it's too expensive. Yeah. It's like two hundred and twenty or two hundred and eighty dollars an hour or something. And you know, we do realize that that is the reality, and that that not all treatments are going to be afforded to you um, where yeah. you live, or it could be very expensive. And we, Bobby and I, are extremely, extremely like I don't even know how to even like. I need to get up like in your face like we are extremely dedicated to making sure that we get you as many resources as possible for free and the, the way that we do that is on this channel no one pays us to do this we do this because we want to and we want to make sure that we can provide as many complimentary resources to you guys as we can especially if you are in a financial situation and that's going to be one of our topics at a later date as well um, finances like trauma survivors and managing your finances because we know that oftentimes when you're raised in an abusive environment you're not sat down at the dinner table and learn how to balance a checkbook or how to save or put 10% in savings and donate the other 10% to church and you know like not everybody was raised in that type of environment and they weren't afforded um, the, the privilege of having those types of skills and um, well definitely I think there, there we could even have like a guest speaker situation Bobby where we talk yeah. about finances one week um, because you know, a reality. The reality is the trauma that we incurred when we were younger. It affected our brain, and tools like this, like EMDR, are are just one of the resources we have to repair the damage that was done to our brain and to our lives. And you know, everyone has consequences to their actions, and we know that we have. Um, made certain choices in our life that are not exactly the healthiest choices because um, for whatever reason we were groomed to do things differently we were we were set up to fail um, we weren't shown what healthy boundaries are we understand all that but the cool thing is you have a choice today today present day right here in this moment the first time you're watching this video you can choose right now that you want to make healthy choices and that you want to 
voraciously read everything that you can possibly read or process any memory that you have or journal if you have to or join a, a free support group if you have to, drive an extra 10 miles to that place or take a bus an extra few miles to go to this one particular place where you know you're going to get support. It's not easy. We are not painting some fairy tale fantasy picture that this is going to be easy for you to recover from your 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 child abuse, your sexual no. abuse. It's not no. easy. It is the hardest thing ever to recover from this, you guys. If you are even alive and watching this and you haven't managed to take your own life because of the demons that you have in your head from the things that were done to you, then well done. You're here for a reason and take this as a sign that you're supposed to live a whole lot longer. So we have an excellent one-page resource that is available to you and I know I did not mention this earlier on in the broadcast but I do want to let you guys know that as a thank you for being one of our loyal subscribers or listeners or viewers we want to give you complimentary access to an entire library of our downloadable resources and you can get that by clicking on the screen once our assistant does our little annotations you'll be able to click on the on the left side of your screen and it will take you to the website. The website will say um, Trauma Recovery University and there will be a tab at the top that says Downloadables. Just click on the Downloadables tab and you'll be given instant access not only to this downloadable resource for this episode but to our entire library of downloadable resources which is over 30 to 35 episodes so far and that's 30 to 35 hours of complimentary um, open dialogue conversations about difficult topics like we did today. So we are just going to zoom right through our one page resource and um, just tweet us out any questions you might have but we're going to we're going to just rapid fire through this. Bobby, <laughs> what do you think? You bet. Um, let's do this. EMDR and again eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, it helps people to heal from the symptoms and the emotional distress as a result of disturbing life experiences. Okay, so that's those of us who have gone through child abuse. It might be someone who has um, survived a war situation, uh, domestic violence, all sorts of reasons why EMDR would be helpful for people. EMDR shows us that the mind can in fact heal from psychological trauma much as the body heals from physical trauma and that's like I told you about the PET scans that we saw of the war veterans how the parts of the brain were dark and then after EMDR they were active. Um, EMDR therapy demonstrates that a similar sequence of events occurs with mental processes. So the brain processes information naturally to move us towards mental health. But if that's blocked or shut off by a disturbing event like our trauma, then the emotional wound festers and causes suffering. But once we remove that block, and that's what EMDR does, it transfers that safe place feeling to something that used to be traumatic, then the brain can heal. Athena, do you want to jump in on any of this, or do you want me just to go through it? Oh no, I'll, I'm happy. I'm happy to to jump in as well. I'm just so excited to finally be able to be giving people all this information. So, um, I'll go ahead and read the next section of our one-page okay. resource. Uh, right there in the middle, there where it says EMDR involves attention to three time periods. We mentioned this earlier, you guys. Yep, you the past, did. present, future. So the focus. Um, is given to the past disturbing memories and the related events of how it's affecting you now in the present. So in the in the current situations that cause distress. And and to developing the skills and the attitudes needed for positive future action. So that's what we're talking about. Like um, whatever is debilitating for you now, we go back, we talk about what it reminds you of, and then we think about the future situation. And all of those items are addressed. So the, the client, that's you, and your therapist who is needs to be um, fully trained in EMDR, yes, by the way. Yes, we, we, we talked about make that sure. this morning. Yeah. Yes. They, they need make to sure have a therapist, right, who's certified and trained. 
Yeah, you can't just have anybody because you could have a very negative experience if someone is not trained in EMDR. There are so many precautions that they take and um, different things to look for in a client if they start to disassociate, and it can be very terrifying for a client. So, um, so the client and the therapist identify possible targets for EMDR processing, like what is it that, that it reminded you of, like we mentioned earlier, like maybe it was the bathtub situation. These include distressing memories, and current situations that cause emotional distress. Other targets may include related incidents in the past. The emphasis is placed on the development of specific skills and behaviors that will be needed by the client in future situations. So taking into consideration that it's something like, well, you can't just never take a bath ever again or never shower ever again. Like that is not realistic. You have to you have to somehow find a way to clean your body. So it's we're gonna work through this so that you can get through these things with ease and, and without um, feeling stressed out. So generally, those with a single event, adult onset trauma, such as like a car accident in your 20s or 30s, can be successfully treated in under five hours. Okay, now this, this is the question that I asked you earlier. So there, okay, there we go. Yeah. So like let's say something happens, like you don't have any childhood trauma, but like, like for instance, like my husband didn't, he didn't grow up in an abusive situation when he was a child, but when he built his house here when he was in his in his 50s, um, it was very, 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 very traumatic for him. People yelled at him. They, they, they tried to um, stop his building project. They did everything they could. They bullied him. It was a horrible, wow. horrible experience for him because he lived in an association and it was just during the peak of the market and it was very traumatic for him, but it was an isolated situation and it was adult onset. So he could easily um, process these, uh, those, the traumatic effects of that right. uh, with, within just a few appointments, within five right. hours. Right. Uh, but the multiple trauma victims may require longer treatment time. Now, guys, if you're watching this broadcast, you're probably a multiple trauma victim. And we're not labeling you a victim. I know some people are very sensitive to that word. But what we're saying is if your trauma happened when you were a child, and you were abused over a long period of time for more more than once, like, you know, not like someone, you know, did something to you one time and then you never thought about it again. Like something that that went on for an extended period of time or that you've thought about and relived the situation over and over and over and over again. That takes a little bit longer. That is when you got to really, you know, um, just get prepared for the long haul and know that it's worth it to work through it. So, and then the last bullet point here is the goal of EMDR, or one of the goals of EMDR is to produce rapid and effective change while the client maintains the equilibrium during and between sessions. Now, it's not always the case that during and in between sessions, that you maintain your equilibrium. That's why it says it's a goal. That's the scary right. part, you guys. The scary part is that during EMDR and in between your appointments, you are easily triggered. You have an emotional hangover, a vulnerability hangover. You are not the same as you were the other day because why? You're processing all of this stuff and you have to practice grounding techniques. You have to put yourself in your safe place more often than not. You have to journal. You have to write, this is what happened on this day. These are the things that triggered me. When I cook potatoes, this is what happens. When I turn right. on the bathtub, this is what happens. The whole point is for you to be able to maintain your equilibrium and have your triggers be not only fewer in number but less in intensity. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Bobby. Okay. EMDR involves the client identifying three things. The vivid visual image related to the memory, a negative belief about self, and the related emotions and body sensations. So again, like Athena talked about earlier, we're not taking you back to the individual tiny itty bitty details of the situation we we want it's still hard I don't mean to dismiss that at all um, but we're not talking about taking you back into a flashback type scenario where it is it is as if you were back there in that moment 
We want the image, we want the negative belief, and the related emotions and body sensations. In addition, the client identifies a positive belief. The therapist helps the client rate the positive belief as well as the intensity of the negative emotions on a scale of 1 to 10. After this, the client is instructed to focus on the image, negative thought, and body sensations while simultaneously engaging in the MDR processing using sets of bilateral stimulation. And I just want to mention that that bilateral stimulation is essential. And it's essential because what that is doing is it is stimulating parts of the brain into reorganizing the memories. Okay, You're stimulating both the right and the left side of the brain. One of the reasons that we get stuck in the trauma, we get stuck in the memories, is because our brain puts things in unusual places and processes the memories in unusual ways in order to protect us. The bilateral stimula stimulation excuse me, um, fixes some of that and gets the memory stored and processed the right way. Okay. Let all right. Let's go back to where we were before. Well, I just hope that you all know that if you have any questions for Bobby or myself regarding EMDR or um, any type of trauma recovery, you can always contact us. We do have a contact sheet that we're going to put up for you. Yep. And I feel like... Um, Bobby, this is such a rapid fire, right? Like this, this is a topic that could be discussed um, at great length. It definitely yes. six, 60 minutes doesn't do it justice because it is so, it's so uh, in depth. You know? Yes, it is. Uh, you know, I think at some point we need to cover. We'll need to have a hangout on. Um, recovery modalities, recovery tools, um, you know, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, dialectical behavioral therapy, EMDR, just the different kinds of therapies that are available. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm having a hard That's time okay. here getting the, well, here we I go. Can <laughs> I can definitely just let you guys know that um, I know that uh, it is difficult to go through these memories and to have a lot of um, fear surrounding working through stuff instead of going around it, over it, or under it. And I understand that personally. We don't want you to think that we're minimizing what you've gone through. And we also don't want to be talking a whole bunch of jargon that you don't understand. The whole point of these broadcasts is for everything to be in layman's terms so that it's easily understandable for you, the client, and we want to be a resource to you. So if you have any questions, there's no such thing as a bad question or a dumb question or anything. If you have questions about what it is that we've discussed here tonight, then please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Oh, perfect segue, Bobby. Look at you. <laughs> I know. Look at me. <laughs> um, hang on just a second. I'm going to cough. So for those of you listening on a podcast platform, um, you can't see that this is a video broadcast and we just popped up our, um, our sheet that has ways that you can reach out to us today. So um, until Bobby comes back, I'm going to go ahead and just read these for you. And we want to invite you to reach out to us on Twitter. And Bobby is at Truth is Hers. I am at Athena Moberg. And we are at Trauma Recovery U. So please email myself or Bobby. My email is athena at athenamoberg.com. And Bobby is at bobbylparish at gmail.com. And we each have our own website where we offer our services and we um, share more about ourselves and our personal journeys and other projects that we work on. Bobby has an amazing website at bobbyparish.com. She's also at thetraumarecoverycoach.com. <laughs> and you can find me at athenamoberg.com. Or this um, broadcast is always available. Our entire video library is available along with all of our downloadable resources over at traumarecoveryuniversity.com or no more shame project.com. Um, friend us on Facebook. 
bobby.parish. I'm uh, Dawn Athena Moberg, not Dawn like a boy, D-O-N, but Dawn, D-A-W-N, like morning. Dawn Athena Moberg, you can friend us. Or you can go to my business page, which is Athena Moberg fan page. Or you can find Bobby on her business Facebook page, which I believe is Bobby Parrish Coaching and Consulting. That's correct. Yay! <laughs> all right. So um, okay. Bobby is doing all of our screen sharing. <laughs> and um, we want to thank you for spending your your hour with us. I know it's been a little bit more than an hour, actually. Or no, we're, we're just about hitting 60 minutes right about now. So okay. um, we are so grateful that you've chosen to spend this evening with us. And we would love for you to join us every week. We're going to read this out to you for those of you listening on a podcast platform. On Mondays, you can find us on Twitter, on a Twitter chat called CSAQT. And that's using the hashtag CSAQT, and that stands for Child Sex Abuse Question Time. Um, this is originally geared towards our UK audience and for those people in the US that maybe work at nighttime. Uh, that's at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 12 noon, no, 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 1 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern. Actually, and this next week will be the first time it's at noon. Oh. Because they switched to daylight savings time on the last Sunday in December, which is this. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry, March. Woo. Sorry about that. In March, which is this Sunday. Okay, so, so yes. it'll be at 6 p.m. UK time. That's right. 10 a.m. in California on the West Coast and 1 p.m. on the East Coast. There you go. <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, of course, we have um, here where you're at with us right now at traumarecoveryuniversity.com um, or you can go to bit.ly forward slash traumarecoveryu. You can find us on Roku TV. You can always watch these videos. I know it is 2 in the morning in the UK, but I, we, we, uh, we always have some people that tune in live uh, in case they can't sleep or something. So it's, it's 2 in the morning on Tuesday for our UK people. And then the original sex abuse chat that was started by Rachel in the OC, our best-selling author and dear friend Rachel Thompson, um, and Bobby Parrish. And that's at 6 p.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays, 9 p.m. Eastern, or 2 in the morning on Wednesdays in the UK. And that's using the hashtag sex abuse chat, and that is a Twitter chat. It's not a live broadcast on YouTube. Right. So two um, Twitter chats, one live broadcast. Yes, and you can catch everything in syndication 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year over at bit.ly, Trauma Recovery U, or by going to traumarecoveryuniversity.com. And then I'm going to have a button on the website um, pretty soon coming up that is going to be all of our Storify links from all of our previous uh, uh, yes. podcasts. I get a lot of people asking me about Storify lately, so I want to honor that and make sure that we make that available to people. And yeah, those are all the transcripts from all of our chats. Yeah, which is super helpful, Bobby. I mean, I have some people that are that are following me on Storify, and I don't even know how or why, but I mean, I want I want us that to be able to be a resource for people. Right. So, um, the only part on our on our sheet that I neglected to mention, Bobby was that we do have private secret Facebook groups that we would love to invite you to. You, you do just need to message us, contact us directly, let us know, hi, um, this is me, and I would like to be invited to your private secret Facebook group for adult survivors of childhood abuse. And you'll be contacted by myself or Bobby or our dear friend Rachel Thompson. And... Um, you then will share a portion of your story with us. Um, the reason that we we vet things that way is to protect the safety of our private secret groups in case there's someone that's predatory out there. So right. um, we do end up um, friending you, um, you know, talking with you. Rachel um, has you um, go on, like her page, friend her, and that way we, we really take everything that we do very seriously even though it's this isn't a nine to five place where we you know get up and drive to the office every day and and go and you know but we take it very seriously as though that 
that is that is what we do. So we want to make sure that the safety of the group is protected and that each and every one of you survivors feel safe to um, be yourself and be open in these private secret groups so that you can receive the peer support that you deserve after so many years of doing it by yourself. So. Yep. Yes, what did I so forget, we hope you'll reach out to us. I can't think of anything. I mean, we have certainly covered a great deal tonight, um, and yeah. you know, and as amazing as it is, uh, there's still lots and lots and lots and lots still to cover. So stick with us. Um, we'll be back next week. I think we talked a little bit um, on break about uh, perhaps covering the topic of um, medical appointments. Um, not only seeing your physician, but seeing your dentist and how those can be very triggering um, for yeah. survivors. We have, uh, we have received an uh, email from one of our people in our community letting us know that she or he has attempted to broach the topic of attending medical appointments and how it can be very triggering as a survivor, um, panic attacks, um, passing out. I mean, I know that I've had people tell me that they pass out when they, uh, they aren't even able to like make it to their appointment. They have to like turn around yeah. and come home. But they don't uh, even schedule the appointment. Some yeah. people haven't been to the doctor in you know the longest time because their their fear is so huge. So we want to give you some coping tools and some strategies. Yeah, and not only not only I mean obviously the coping strategies are super duper important, but we want to discuss openly the different um, ways that being afraid of the doctor um, can affect you and let you know that you're not alone because sometimes yes. it can feel like, oh, is this just me? Am I the crazy person that just doesn't like to go to the dentist? Like everybody in the whole world goes to the dentist. What's the problem? But, you know, reality is that's not the case. It's not the case. Not everybody in the whole wide world has lived through what you've went, lived through. Not everybody... Um, that attends their doctor's appointments or dental appointments survived being um, groomed or held down or assaulted or violated for years on end. You know, so anyone who did probably is experiencing something similar to you. And since no one's really having the discussion, everyone thinks right. it's just them. So right. we're gonna pull those boogeymen out from underneath the beds and in those dark closets and we're going to shine some light on them next week and talk about medical appointments and we hope that you'll tune in with us next week, same time, same place. Yes, we'll see you then. <laughs>